This is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to the Whole Horse Podcast. I'm coming to you from the Cowichan Valley on beautiful Vancouver Island in Canada, and I'm excited to be bringing amazing instructors from around the world to share their knowledge about all the ways that we can keep ourselves and our horses well and happy, and about some of the cutting edge techniques, training, and different aspects that are coming into the horse industry and changing it from within. I'm so excited you're here, and I'm excited about the times that we live in and the shifts that are happening in the horse industry before our eyes. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. It's Alexa Linton here, and you're on the Whole Horse Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Sarah Sloty. I'm working on getting her last name pronunciation just right, and very excited and interested in the work that Sarah is doing with something called Equisoma. And we have been working together to, to bring this to you. And I'm so excited for you to share more about you, Sarah. Thank you for being here today. Like I said, it's a real privilege. Wonderful. So Sarah, because this may be quite new for some of the listeners, I'd love you to share a little bit about your background um, and the work that you're up to now. I, I know it's been quite the progression, but uh, this new work that you're doing, or, or I'm sure it's not that new. <laughs> So, certainly. So I'm a registered psychotherapist by trade, uh, Canadian certified counselor and somatic experiencing practitioner, which gives me a whole bunch of initials after my name that most people don't really know what they mean. Um, and so I'll maybe de de demystify that just a little bit. Um, so a registered psychotherapist means that I mainly work in mental health and, uh, and it's kind of like um, providing therapy for individuals who have a wide range of challenges ranging. Typically, my focus area is working with trauma. Uh, and attachment difficulties in relationships, uh, and trauma being a really broad category that often people will not identify as being part of their experience. But often when you look back far enough, there's often some sort of something that happened when we were younger that led to difficulties today, um, even if we wouldn't necessarily think of the word trauma as being a description, description for that. Mm. Um, so that's my, my main work. Somatic Experiencing Practitioner uh, refers to um, the work of a, a person named Dr. Peter Levine, who we'll certainly have a chance to talk more about today. Um, and somatic meaning of the body and experiencing meaning, experiencing, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this idea of experiencing the body, right, or the soma. And so Peter's work was really around looking at um, how animals in the wild, while routinely threatened, are rarely experiencing things like PTSD. Animals in the wild rarely walk around with anxiety disorders and, you know, ulcers and things like that. They, the animals in the wild do have some challenges, and it doesn't mean that animals in the wild don't experience trauma, but for the routine amount of threat and danger they experience, he found that that wasn't happening as often as we do see in captive animal populations and in humans of course mm -hmm. which are like domesticated animals really yes very domesticated <laughs> <laughs> and so he he got really curious as to why that was and so he eventually over time through his research and his studies um, developed a method of working with trauma resolution in the nervous system to help resolve all these sen sets of complex symptoms that he was noticing were occurring um, as a result of people experiencing certain life situations uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But mm -hmm. somatic experiencing practitioner refers to the fact that I've completed training in Dr. Peter Levine's work, mm -hmm. uh, which is super relevant to working with horses, whether it's in the field of equine assisted therapy and learning, or just in having horses as an an average individual, you know, who enjoys horses and is into training horses or into a particular discipline or just enjoys horse time. I find a lot of the, the knowledge from that particular field of work and the broader field of trauma-informed care really important in understanding how to work with horses effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so help, help us with this concept of trauma-informed care. I was, I was sharing with Sarah that this is only something that's dropped in for me over the last year or so. 
Um, and I think for a lot of us, it's, it's, a, it's a new idea. Um, yeah, what, what does that mean for you, Sarah? So trauma-informed care, trauma-informed services, trauma-informed equestrianship, if we could invent something like that, trauma-informed <laughs> horsemanship, trauma-informed equine-assisted therapy, uh, you know, so you could add trauma-informed in front of pretty much anything, right? Trauma-informed medicine, trauma-informed social work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is understanding that trauma is really its own area and trauma impacts so many areas of an individual's development from their mental capacity to their emotional um, range, to their body responses, to their relational patterns, to their ability to connect with themselves and feel whole within themselves, to their sense of connection with community and culture and spirituality and so on. And trauma comes in and disrupts all of those things. And often when we don't have a trauma lens on behavior, on relationships, on patterns, whether that's usually in relationship with other people. But what I'm arguing is that trauma-informed care also applies to our relationships with our horses. Absolutely. With our pets in general, mm -hmm. with our trainers and coaches, and, you know, and all this stuff. But if we start to step back and look at, oh, okay, what is a trauma lens on the interactions that are happening here? What's going on for me that's perhaps residual of my own patterns and my own history that's playing out in this relationship dynamic? Mm -hmm. What's going on for my coach, my trainer, my therapist, my whatever that's coming into this dynamic that's affecting the ability to be effective? what's going on for the horse in this situation what's the horse's trauma background and experiences of chronic stress and and captivity issues that are contributing to behavior dynamics and when you start looking at all these things through a trauma lens our perception of things starts to shift Mm -hmm. you know, rather than look at somebody else whether that's a human or an animal as what's wrong with you we shift to what's happened to you Mm -hmm. what's contributing to this dynamic and this behavior pattern right now and what do we do to make that better given our understanding that there's a pattern here that may be trauma and trauma based mm -hmm. right and this this is huge i mean we're seeing the trauma informed literature really explode in the last 10 15 years around you know how to bring in trauma informed care into schools so there's trauma informed schools now as this area wow. of growth you know to getting teachers understanding trauma and how to look at behavior in children through a trauma lens and go oh they're not being difficult there's actually good reason as to why this is happening Mm -hmm. right it's, it's because of trauma it's because of fear about being in relationship it's about emotional dysregulation or nervous system dysregulation there's all sorts of things that are playing out that if you just looked at the sub the subject the the client the human the horse as a well they've got a problem yeah there's something wrong with them you need to get over it and get a hold of yourself and then we yank them a bit bit more strongly or we kick into the ribs more strongly or we try to you know shut down the other person across from us or we get super critical or we just say well you should be over this by now and whatever mm. it's not particularly trauma informed right we're not understanding yeah. that the reaction is actually coming out of something that's really um involuntary typically Absolutely. and it's and it's the organism's best attempt at keeping themselves safe given their background and their environment and what they're responding to as cues mm, wow wow yes so important with horses um you know and i think it, it is very common for someone to to look at a horse who's who's behaving badly in quotes quotation marks there um, and think of them as a bad horse or mean or naughty, um, so to speak. And so this just really shifts the, the conversation um, into another space. This is what this has had to happen with schools as well, with, with mental health practitioners as well, with medical doctors as well, you know, because our tendency is to look at pathology, right? Absolutely. Our tendency is to look at what's wrong, what's wrong with you, what, what, what is the, what is defective here? Mm -hmm. And you need to just get better. You need to stop doing this thing. You need to stop acting in ways that are pissing me off. Which is basically like, okay, but hang on a second here. Right? You know, not everything is a deliberate slight. Usually there's good reason as to why there's a response of this kind, right? If we step back a little bit mm -hmm. and, and hold a wider, more mindful view of a situation and go, okay, what's, what's playing out here? 
right? Because then our stuff gets in the way of having a trauma-informed lens, right? We get triggered into our stuff. You're insulting me. You're deliberately hurting me because chances are somewhere in the past, there would have been some sort of hurt involving someone hurting somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we get overly sensitive to when we're manipulated by others. And, and so then our trauma history. Wow. <laughs> I was going to say, there's this like, not very fun loop that starts happening. Yes. Mm. In human, in human terms, we'll call the, a particular pattern gaslighting. So we hear that a lot in the media yes. with, with like the hashtag me too movement. Yes. Right? And this gaslighting idea, which is you've got somebody who's mistreating somebody else and the somebody else, for lack of a better word, we'll call the victim or the survivor, right? The, so the somebody else, the victim, I don't like that language, but just bear with me. So the victim has a reaction and very naturally to their own mistreatment. But then the person who's the abuser will basically slam this person for their reaction, calling them crazy. What's wrong with you? You've got an issue. And the person who's causing the abuse is not recognizing the impact of their behavior on the person and that the person's response is actually quite normal given the circumstances and quite reasonable. Yes. Right? And so we gaslight our animals all the time. Oh my know? gosh. <laughs> I'm like just thinking, I'm like, oh dear. Yeah, inadvertently, some of us, it's, it's inadvertent, right? We, yes. we blame the reaction in the other without looking at what we might have done to contribute to said reaction. Mm-hmm. Right. And often I think with animal lovers, we're, 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 I think uh, in, in general, we're a, 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 a kind hearted group of people. I think if we're into animals, mostly for the most part, we're there for good reasons with good intentions. So I, th- I would say for a lot of what we're seeing with this sort of pattern of let's blame the victim mentality, like we do with our animals, it comes out of this unconscious place of not recognizing. Right? Yes. Yeah. And so we're wanting to really build awareness around, okay, what's going on for me? And this is what happens in the human therapy world as well. And in human relationships and in oh. relationships or couples therapy, you know, is okay, let's, let's step back just for a moment and go, okay, what is, what is playing out here? What is the dynamic here? Yes. Because most of my work, as I was telling you earlier, is sort of in office with clients. And I have this sort of subset of my work, which involves humans and horses. And, and I find that the in-office stuff is, especially with the somatic understanding and an understanding of the neuroscience of trauma and the neuroscience of attachment in relationships and patterns that happen, this completely overlaps with working with horses because horses are just another person, wow. person, entity to be in a relationship with. Yes. I think about, I think it was, it in, was it India or Mexico that gave dolphins status of personhood? So I, I, it's not wrong for me to say that their horses are persons. I <laughs> totally. I, I'm with you on that <laughs> That's a bit of a flip, but you know, we technically we could consider them as, you know, they're sentient beings that have personhood, you know, Absolutely. If you call them that, but, mm-hmm. but they're another relationship like anything else. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so if in human relationships, the, how we heal human relationships is by looking at the trauma patterns and the attachment dynamics mm-hmm. and all these sort of underlying things. And we have to look at ourselves and what we bring to the relationship. Why are we not doing this with our animals? Well, it's just yes. another relationship. And so this lens yes. completely applies here too. Oh my goodness. This yeah. is awesome. <laughs> I have, I wrote a list before we came on the call of Sarah knows and she's like, I think that we're going to have to do more than one. Podcast. <laughs> and so I'm realizing as you're speaking, I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's so much here. Um, so mm-hmm. with this trauma informed care, we talk, you shared a little, there's a couple of words there that people are probably getting, getting a little curious about. So one of them that you shared was dysregulation. Um, And I know this has lots of implications all over the place, but what does that, what does that mean for you? So uh, um, like I was saying earlier to you, before we started recording this, this chat, um, this is a concept that I find is really amenable to visual drawings. And so, (laughs) so what I will do so that the listeners have the advantage of actually having a visual Mm -hmm. is I will send you some diagrams that you can use on your website so that the the listeners have something to refer to visually as they hear me speak about this concept. Fantastic. So that'll be at wholehorse.ca everyone. Just, just if you're looking. Okay. Great. We'll get that up for you guys shortly. Um, so, so bear with me as I try to fumble my way through describing this without a a chalkboard or something to draw it out. 
Did I just age myself by saying chalkboard? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not, Not at all. At all. No. <laughs> the last generation that had chalkboard um, in school. So, um, so dysregulation. So, if we think about, um, if you think of the word regulation, what comes to mind for you, Alexa? Like just regulation in general speak. Um, I, I think, oh, you know, because I'm geeky, I think physiology, I think, uh, you know, reptilian midbrain, I think, you know, you know, my heart rate, my breathing, my, you know, my physiology, it's, it's regulating itself. There's a, there's a homeostasis that's happening, hopefully. Yeah. Within my body. Hopefully. <laughs> 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 All's going well. We all hope that things are going well. Yes. Um, so, so regulation in, in our for our purposes in this call today, um, is really looking at what happens in the nervous system when things are functioning properly. Mm -hmm. Some people would call that coherence. There's a huge body of work, especially those of you who are listening in who, un who know about the HeartMath Institute. Um, some people who do equine assisted therapy from your, your audience may be familiar with this idea of coherence. Um, and heart rate variability. So that may be language that some of you may already be familiar with. If not, definitely go check out HeartMath Institute. They've got some really neat stuff. Um, but if we think about this idea of regulation or of coherence in the nervous system, basically it's that things are functioning as they should be, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're feeling safe in relationship, when we're connected with one another, and there's a sense of safety, and that's a really big topic. Mm -hmm. When our nervous system feels safe, life goes as normal. We have, our energy is freed up to be in relationship, to play, to be curious, to mate, to, to be creative, to, you know, to do all the things that we do when we're feeling safe, right? Stephen Poor just talks about the transformative power of feeling safe and just what happens when the nervous system does not feel safe. Mm -hmm. So what starts to happen is, let's say you've been in a, an experience or a series of experiences where your nervous system detected a sense of danger or life threat. Your nervous system will come out of that state of feeling safe in relationship, safe in connection, and will start to mount a, a self-protective response. Mm. Right? So the self-protective response is kind of like the nervous system's gas pedal. Yeah. Right. And the nervous system's gas pedal, sometimes people will call that the um, sympathetic nervous system response, yeah. rest response, commonly known as that. And when that gas pedal starts to kick in, it's because the nervous system goes, hmm, there is a sense of danger here. I should start preparing to mobilize for that danger. Mm -hmm. Right. So a whole bunch of things start to happen in the body that's that prepares us to get ready to do something. Right. And now typically that's something will be to, you know, deal with the, the danger, either to move away from it or to move towards it, to fight it off. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so that gas pedal will start to increase. So when you feel like you're in your stress response, Alexa, when you're in a stressful situation, what do you notice happens? that tells you you're in a stress response. Um, I tend to feel like I start sweating. <laughs> that's one thing. Yeah. Hands will start sweating. Yeah. Um, yeah, my heart rate goes up generally. My breathing gets high, uh, higher up in my chest. Right. I might even feel like a, f if it's really like fast, I might even feel a flush of heat, flush of heat. in my body uh, yeah. and tension, of course, as yeah. well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Heart rate starts to increase. Blood pressure starts to increase, right? There's a sense of readiness of, okay, I've, I'm going to be doing something here. Mm -hmm. Whatever mm -hmm. that something ends up being. Right. And then generally speaking, um, there, we're going to mount that response to that stress. And then when that stress passes and we've been successful in addressing the stressor, the nervous system will come down. Yes. Right. So when, so signs of the nervous system deactivating, which some people will call the parasympathetic nervous system, um, the relaxation responses, other words we'll hear for this, you know, this heart rate will start to slow, you know, blood pressure will return to normal, muscles will, will, will no longer be contracted, we'll start to notice, you know, eyes are no longer as focused and narrow, we're able to have a wider gaze again, we're able to take in information about our surroundings that isn't just threat information, we're able to orient to resources and good things and connection and all these these yeah. things again, right yeah and so so the nervous system comes down and when 
historically, when there's been a, a lot of chronic stress where the nervous system continually revs and revs and mm -hmm. revs because there's a perpetual sense and experience of danger, yeah. right? then we're gonna to start to see what we would call dysregulation in the nervous system, okay. right? Where it's not this easy ebb and flow of the nervous system response. Yeah. We're starting to see a nervous system that's primed for problems, right? Okay. I'm, my nervous system is going, wow, I have good reason to always be on guard, mm -hmm. right? There, I need to be on guard, I have no choice to be on guard. My nervous, there's something always that tells me. And sometimes it's not conscious. Our nervous system will pick up on really subtle cues that we kind of don't even know are happening. Like um, Stephen Porges's polyvagal theory is really fascinating because literally even the muscles of our inner ear mm -hmm. will start to tune the middle ear towards listening to sounds of threat. So if there are certain tones and certain sounds that are at a really low vibrational tone, that in mammals would signal growls, stampedes, you know, sounds of predatory or dangerous situations, the nervous system will start to listen for those low level vibrational tones. And it could be a rattle of a weird ventilation system in your office or your therapist's office wow. that you start to go, why don't I feel comfortable here? And you might never realize that it's the ventilation system until the ventilation system stops and suddenly you go, whoa, I feel better all of a sudden. Yeah. Why, why do suddenly I don't feel anxious now? Yeah. And so the whole nervous system is this really amazingly rich and complex organism that comes together and picks up on, of, on signs of danger and threat. Mm. And if we're continually picking up on signs of danger and threat in the environment, which includes in relationship with other beings, then our nervous system is going to start to be primed for stress response on a regular basis over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And especially, so if we think about this in the wild, and this is where Peter Levine's work comes in and is really fascinating. So if we're in the wild and yeah. we're trying to respond to a sense of danger, we're going to, we're going to, or we're going to pause, right? We're going to, some people call this the freeze response. We're going to freeze. We're going to arrest and notice the environment and orient to where the signs of threat are. We're, our ears, we're gonna get very still, we're gonna take in information, and then our nervous system is going to fight or to flee, yes. right? Now there's more to it than this. I'm gonna talk about fawn response and other social responses in a little while, because I think that's really important to not disregard. But yes. if we simplify it down, so we've got this startle response, we orient to the environment, what's going on, and then the nervous system, if it detects there's a sense of threat, that sympathetic nervous system response kicks in, we start to get all charged up and ready to deal with the threat or the stressor, and then we're going to fight or to flee. And if you're a gazelle somewhere on the plains of Africa and you're trying to run away from a cheetah or a leopard or something, right, you're gonna run as best as you can. Yeah. We tend to fight when we're kind of cornered, right? Some species will fight more as a primary response, other species will fight as a secondary response but you're gonna run and if you get cornered, you might fight. And then if you get caught, so let's say you're not successful in your fleeing or your fighting. Mm -hmm. We'll go into what some people will call a freeze. Some people will call that an immobility response. Um, but, and some people will call that tonic immobility, which is where we get really rigid and we just tune out and check out. Yes. And sometimes there's a collapse response where we lose tonicity, we get floppy. Right. And we collapse and we're just out, you know, and there's faint, which is a version of that. And so animals in the wild will, if they're unable to fight or to flee successfully, will go into what we call a freeze or a collapse, right, of some response. And it's a surrendering to what's about to happen. Yeah. And it's re what's really fascinating about the freeze response or this immobility response is that it's kind of like nature's painkiller, right? If, totally. if you know, a whole bunch of analgesic sort of neurochemicals come and flood the system. And so it's kind of like a way to, to not be present to what's happening. Completely. I think, it, yeah, I think it was um, Woody Allen, a famous quote by Woody Allen was, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be present when it happens. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's like the body going, okay, I think that there's pain coming. There's pain so coming. Let's, in. let's, yeah, <laughs> let's just shut down on that one. Let's shut down or dissociate or disconnect or, or just not be here for this experience. And totally. so animals in the wild, if they're unable to fight or to flee successfully, will go into a freeze. 
a shutdown response and surrender to death should it happen. Yeah. If you die, there's no trauma because you died. It's rather straightforward, right? If animals in the wild, let's say we're lucky, right? And the predator gets distracted, which happens. There's plenty of YouTube videos of animals getting distracted by, and getting away from their prey and the prey surviving. Um, that can happen. So let's say you're in this sort of shutdown response and your predator gets distracted and goes away or something else happens. You may have the chance to come out of that freeze response, mm. complete your escape and, and survive to live another day. Yeah. And one thing that animals do under natural conditions, humans can as well, animals in captivity can too, provided we understand that this is what's happening and we allow for it, when we're coming out of that freeze or immobility response, the nervous system, whatever goes up must come down, right? Mm -hmm. So all that stress that went into the freeze response, because I was trying to fight or to flee, it wasn't possible, I go into a freeze. If I'm lucky enough to thaw out of freeze, yeah. the nervous system has to discharge or deactivate all that energy that was locked in the system prior to going into immobility. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll see in humans and in, and in non-human animals, when this is permitted and when it's understood, under these natural conditions, the nervous system will start to come down and it can look really subtle, like a tremor or a shiver. And other times it looks as big as a grand mal seizure. It, mm. it, it's like all of a sudden the body starts to, Thank some you. people don't like the word discharge. People understand the word discharge. It's not exactly that, but we'll use that for argument's sake. Yeah the body starts to discharge or deactivate what was residual in the nervous system mm. that was held before going into that immobility response, mm -hmm. right? So if you were unable to fight or to flee and the only option was to freeze or like I said, go into submission, go into appeasement, go into mm -hmm. all sorts of fawning behaviors, which are social behaviors that we do to protect ourselves when we can't fight or flee. Mm -hmm then when we come out of that freeze type state or that functional freeze state where we're in appeasement and we're doing all these things to try to keep ourselves safe, suddenly what we start to see is a lot of, you know, a lot of big movements. We yeah. might see a fight response show up where there's growling or a desire to throw a punch and, you know, and so all of a sudden all that energy has to get used up mm -hmm. before we come back down to what we call balance or homeostasis. Right. Right. And so here's the big long answer to your short question around dysregulation. Right. When this process occurs as nature intended, what goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. When this happens, we would have a very resilient, regulated nervous system. Mm -hmm. right? Whether you're an animal or a human animal. Right. Yeah. When this process gets interrupted. When we get stuck and we're not able to fight successfully, we're not able to flee successfully, our attempts at fighting or fleeing or even appeasing and submission are met with more abuse, more pain, more torment, more stress. Yes. We're gaslit. Our, our responses are not understood. And we're further, uh, you know, mistreated for our responses, right? Mm -hmm. So anything we do does not work. We learn learned helplessness. Yes. We go into immobility response. And where we start to see dysregulation happening is that there is no completion of that cycle. Mm -hmm. We have to shut down the natural fight response. We shut down the impulse to flee. What we start to see are fidget behaviors, right? right. We start to bottle up our rage and our anger. So we start noticing more explosive behaviors. Why, in, in humans and in non-human animals. Wow. Why are we seeing this, this organism respond in this way? Why did they react like that? Why are they pacing mm -hmm. and having, and we'll start to see addictions. We'll start to see OCD type behaviors, obsessive compulsive type right. behaviors in humans and in animals that are- I was gonna say, that. this is where maybe you're seeing cribbing or weaving yes. or pawing or you know different things like this. You got it, because I'm in distress, I'm away from my social herd, I'm- yeah. I'm confined, I can't move, I can't engage in my flight response behavior because yeah. I'm contained, I'm in a box, right? Yes. You know? And so what we see in these animals, um, and I love ethologist Lucy Reese's work because she talks a lot about captivity behaviors. And it's exactly what Peter Levine talks about mm -hmm. in Somatic Experiencing, is what we're seeing are captivity behaviors in humans. Wow. And I go, but that's exactly what we're seeing in horses and in other animals, and in zoo animals, and animals in the entertainment industry, and animals in factory farms, and so on, mm -hmm. right? We're seeing the impact of the trauma 
and the incomplete self-protective responses to get your needs met. And so the nervous system has to hold all this energy, this pent up energy, and it has nowhere to go. And so this regulation looks like what we'll call hyper arousal. So it's kind of like the nervous system is turned on on too much. So anxiety, panic attacks, rage, resentment in humans. You might not see that as much in animals, but I would, I would wager some animals show resentment. Yes. You know? <laughs> <I would> say, <laughs> right. Like the seething kind of pissy behavior, you know, you're like, Oh, okay. What, you know, what's going on here? So, yeah. so non-human animals and human animals, while different in some ways are also very similar in other respects because we're mammals and mammals share a nervous system, which regulates the body and it share attachment dynamics. And so yeah. We've, we've got these similarities that, that we can kind of predict. And so you'll start to see hyper arousal. So like I said, panic, anxiety, rage, anger, outbursts, acting out, right? Um, in humans, racing yeah. thoughts, yeah. hyper vigilance, et cetera, et cetera. Or we'll see on the low end, like hypo arousal. So arousal yeah. that's too low. Yeah. Checked out, tuned out, dissociated, disconnected. I'm zoned out. I'm no longer here. Yeah. Depressed, right? The slow moving, slow emotional responses. No emotional responses. Uh-huh. Right? W- walking around in a fog. I'm not really here. And dysregulation would be this sort of pattern of being in these extremes of either hyper or hypo aroused because of what didn't get a chance to complete in the nervous system. Uh-huh. What's being held? If everything I do is not successful and nothing leads to the desired result and I don't find balance again, this is what starts to ensue. And so we'll see like the OCD type behaviors like cribbing and stall weaving and pacing along fence lines and wind sucking and licking excessively on fur areas, Uh you know, and we see this in humans too. Humans have that as well. We we see addiction behaviors in humans and in non-human animals, right? Absolutely. As a result of all this pent up energy, these adverse conditions wow. that lead to that. And I'm assuming that this also leads to internalized symptoms. Um, you know, we see in horses, especially in captivity, just an incredible amount of ulceration in the digestive system and, um, you know, these sorts of, you know, internalized stress type uh, symptomologies. Yeah. Ulcers also occur in humans for very similar reasons. And why do ulcers occur in humans? Stress response, <laughs> you know, unresolved chronic stress, right? And what's the chronic stress? Is, is it because of what's going on in your family of origin? It's because you were separated from your caregivers. It's like, you know, stresses or stressors that, that are chronic in adulthood that don't ever seem to resolve, right? Mm-hmm. And so when those stressors don't resolve or we're not successful in fighting or fleeing and protecting ourselves, that energy just stays in the system, mm-hmm. right? Because the world is telling my nervous system that it's not safe. And so that those things start to get impacted with, we know that with foals, foals that get ulcers, you often is linked to foals being separated from their mom yeah. too early, yeah. right? And then placed into stalls or placed separately and fed foods that are not correct, you know, not ideal for their diets. And so we've got these environmental conditions and we've got these attachment ruptures, which lead to ulcers and gut issues in humans. Yes. And through, no, no surprise, ulcers and gut issues in animals, yeah. right? Because of the early attachment ruptures, because of early weaning, because of mistreatment, because of deprivation, yeah. same in humans. And it's so fascinating to me to look at the parallels in both. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so the big question then, <laughs> with all of this and, and, you know, we see it, I, I know for myself, if, you know, working with animals, horses specifically, the big attachment wounds are, um, you know, being separated. Mm-hmm. too young usually um, yeah. and without care and and understanding of of the impact yeah. as, as well as mamas um, having their babies taken those are two of the main ones sure. um, right uh so and, and also also i think like gelding is one of those ones too that's very very traumatic for for many horses and has a, a quite a grand impact on them so the question now would be for me what, what do we do how do we help yeah. And, and that's, that's, I think this is where, as a starting place for us having these conversations is this is where trauma informed, a trauma informed lens is super important. Yes. 
Right. And I, it, it's been my sort of life's mission ever since I learned about trauma informed care, I would say around 2006 to, to really just go, okay, this is a lens that we should be having in multiple areas, you know, and, and it, it, it applies to horsemanship, equestrianship, whatever you want to call this sort of horse husbandry area. It applies there as well. You know, and we often say, well, you know, I, I love animals and anthropomorphization and people will often sort of throw the anthropomorphization argument in there, which frustrates me to no end because, they, <laughs> yes. you know, oh, well, you're just basically equating horse emotions with human emotions and you can't do that. And horses have their own experiences. Yes, granted. But there's also, um, what's the word? Anim animalocentrism. Um, which is what I call mammaliocentrism, which is basically that we're all mammals and it's completely inaccurate to take a human that has particular brain structures and a horse that has the same brain structures that support emotional experience uh -huh. and say that horses don't experience it, but that humans do. And that it's anthropomorphization to say that yeah. a horse is having a, an emotion like fear or that horse is having hypervigilance or that horse is, is anxious and say, well, that's a human emotion. It's like, but horses yeah. and other mammals have the same brain structures exactly. as humans. Exactly. And that's the work of um, effective neuroscience, Yak Pongsep, who unfortunately passed away in the last year. Um, whose work is really fascinating because he looked at basically all these different emotional pathways in human and non-human animals to basically debunk this myth that to attribute emotions to animals is anthropomorphization, which it's not. Yeah. Um, because you can't suddenly separate out humans as a particular form of primate, as a particular form of mammal, and say only humans can experience these things, everyone else can't. It's a very odd assumption. It's a well, very it's odd. A, in my mind. It's a cop out. It's a it's a it's an excuse to to act in um, ways that are, you know, yeah, that that are are not great. You know? I wrote, I wrote an article about can animals consent on my blog of, mm. earlier this year and. Um, and I talk about this sort of anthropomorphization sort of argument that people will throw out there and say, you know, you can't anthropomorphize animals and they're doing it with good intentions because they come out of that generation that was taught thou shalt not do this because that's not being kind to animals and you can't put human emotions on animals and call that, you know, a certain thing. We now know that that's not accurate, but you know, they're coming out of good intentions. But in the article, I talk about this idea of, you know, is, is the anthropomorphization card, uh, like you said, is, is it an excuse for exploitation or an excuse to continue doing what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a tough one to say because a lot of people will argue and they don't like the feeling of what we would call, um, oh, what's the name? It's in the media a lot these days. Um, cognitive dissonance. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance is the sense of, I believe myself to be a certain way. And I'm being presented with information that disconfirms my belief. Mm. And so I don't like the feeling that that creates. And so I'm going to disregard the incoming information to stay with my belief that I'm a certain way. Absolutely. Right. And that's a known, a very known psychological concept. And so it applies in our relationships with animals as well. Right. And so that when we're challenged, we go into our shame response, we go into a cognitive dissonance and we go, no, this is inaccurate. And we feel more supported in our beliefs and reject incoming information, even if it's valuable or has merit. Yes. Right. And so, so this is where that trauma lens is important yet again. It's like, oh, what's my yes. reaction to hearing this information? Right. Yes. Right. Well, and it's also recognizing, you know, I, I know from myself on my own journey, you know, coming from a very traditional horsemanship space sure. and having, you know, uh, created my own trauma in horses, you know, um, due to my own, like, this was what I was taught and this is how yeah. I do things. So then when, when things started to change, I can totally relate to that cognitive dissonance because I was, I was like, no, like this was the right way because it, it took so much to look at myself and go, oh no, like I've been imposing or, or, you know, actually causing the very thing that I would like, never want to cause in horses or, or animals, right? So it was, it was quite the, the, the pill to swallow, so to speak. Um, and it is every time for me as well, when I catch myself going into a reaction with my own animals or my mm -hmm. own my dogs or my horses, 
you know, where I find myself ha doing the very thing that I preach to others not to do. Completely. <laughs> it's such a human experience, right? We're humans. We have a nervous system. We have reactions. We have personality, yeah. right? And, and so we're going to have moments where we goof up. And the, I think this big thing, whether the relationship is with an animal or the relationship is with another human, there needs to be this place of being able to work on our own shame response. Mm -hmm. Find that place of humility to go, okay what's going on here? What am I potentially doing to contribute to this situation? Which is tough because it does require turning the mirror back towards ourselves. Yes. Right. And looking at what am I bringing into this relationship dynamic? What am I doing that might be contributing to this response? Because it's just a relationship like any other. Mm -hmm. right? And so they're going to respond. They have a nervous system that regulates their experience. They have attachment dynamics. So do we. And if we're not even looking at our own attachment patterns, if we go into attachment relationships, so this is maybe a conversation for another time as well, yes, but part yes. of this trauma lens is also understanding attachment ruptures, right? And if as humans, I have maybe an, an insecure, anxious attachment style, and my insecure, anxious attachment style makes me have makes me be more needy or more clinging in relationship. I'm going to look to my horse to be more for me than maybe my horse can be, mm -hmm. right? And I'll get more triggered when the horse doesn't come to me in the field because it triggers my sense of rejection and my, and my anxious attachment pattern, which is you need to do this thing for me. And then I might get annoyed and then I might be really pissy with my horse when I do go out and halter him, right? Because you're not doing this thing and no one loves me. And the next thing you know, we're back in our trauma cycle, yeah. right? <laughs> I feel like you're literally speaking to me right now. <laughs> And then we might get more pissy and more difficult with our horses and we might be more likely to use the stick or the wand or the whatever it is that we use. And because we're annoyed yes. or we're pissed off because our needs didn't get met yet again in relationship, right? Yes. And the horse is and doing it. Why can't you be like this? You know, right? Why are you doing this deliberately to piss me <laughs> off? And it's like, well, no, uh, there, there's more going on, but that if we're not looking at the attachment style, right? Yes. You know, then we're also going to be missing part of that trauma lens on what's going on in the dynamic because it's a relationship like any other relationship. Yeah. Just because they happen to have four legs and they're big and they're furry doesn't mean that they're not a relationship. Mm -hmm. right? So I think to myself, horsemanship, ideally, and I'm not a horsemanship trainer. I'm not a, a horseback rider trainer. I'm not a coach. I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not any of those things. But when I think about what helps human relationships improve, we have a couples therapist, right? And we have a couples therapist who looks at trauma, who looks at attachment dynamics and addresses all those things to help those relationship dynamics get better, to find more security in the attachment relationship, oh. more safety in the relationship. And when we're safer, our nervous system comes down out of fight or flight. Our nervous system comes down out of appeasement and out of freeze. And we're able to be in that place where we're connected with each other. Mm -hmm. because we're feeling safe and there's safety in the environment and safety within the relationship. And then something different can emerge. And so I go, wow, shouldn't horsemanship instruction be like couples therapy? <laughs> really Honestly, should. Really, because it's relationship dynamics. Absolutely. Right? We come at it in this more instrumental kind of behavioral way, as in we want to get this thing done. You want to learn horseback riding. You need to get on the horse's back. You need to saddle up, da, 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 da. Right. Yes. Here and are the steps. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I think maybe this new field of like equine behaviorists are, are coming in to maybe be these like couples therapists of the equine world. Totally. Because yeah. I think that's perhaps what, what I'm seeing happening is I go, there should be couples therapists for humans and their horses. Um, you know, and I think that's what maybe what they're trying to move in the direction of. Absolutely. We're seeing that, that flow, right? Yeah. It's people going, okay, there seems to be a connection yeah. here, especially as, you know, in my mind, horses are kind of getting a little bit more to the end of their rope in, in some ways and sort of, you know, there's, there's a bit more spaciousness for them to, you know, express or come forward with like, hey, yeah. I'm not so happy within, <laughs> within this dynamic. That's it not really working for me. But, well, this is it. And then, so this comes back to this idea of, if we had to summarize our call for today, like I think about this idea of trauma-informed care and where do we begin with your question, which is like, where do we go from here? And I go, well, the first thing that crosses my mind um, as a simple thing, then there's going to be more complex things mm -hmm. that we can talk about another time. But the more, on the more simple end of things, I think about, excuse me, I think about principles of trauma-informed care. 
And they're, they're consistent regardless of the industry, whether it's trauma-informed schools, trauma-informed medicine, trauma-informed social work, trauma-informed psychotherapy, trauma-informed, you name it, right? Fill in the gap. Yeah. Um, the principles are cross-disciplinary. Mm -hmm. And these principles are pretty, are pretty consistent and they apply to the field of horsemanship, equestrianship, um, equine assisted therapy and learning. Whatever you're doing with horses or other animals, it applies here too. So those principles are in no particular order, consent, choice, voice, empowerment or control, depends on the model you're looking at, mm -hmm. safety, trust, collaboration, trauma awareness and scope of practice. Wow. Yeah. So if I break this down into what's really simple, right? Mm -hmm. so consent, my, like my blog post was, mm -hmm. can animals consent, right? And if you don't like the word consent, can they assent? They can certainly assent and express dissent, right? Yes. If you're not happy with the word consent because it's got too many legal connotations in the human world, fine, let's put that aside. Mm -hmm. But animals can express agreeance and they can express no. Right? Yes. Animals have a yes and a no. And if we're not paying attention to that, we need to be paying attention to that. Part of recovery in a trauma-informed care model is offering animals that yes and that no. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we don't have to have animals do stuff they don't want to do because even humans, we have to do stuff we don't want to do sometimes. Yes. Right? It's actually very kind and loving to help a horse learn how to tolerate a medical procedure. Yes. Right? Just because it doesn't want to. And it could say, no, I don't want to do this. And you can go, okay, horsey, let's not do that. And then the horse never gets medical care. Yeah. That's too far of an extreme on that interpretation. Totally. Right? There's a place for doing things that are just uncomfortable. Yeah. Then how do we help build the window of tolerance to tolerate discomfort? Yes. And that's what we're wanting to do, right? Yeah. We can coerce ourselves or an animal into doing something, or we can help build its capacity and its tolerance to do said thing, which is very different. Yes. Right? And it's not that one, it's not that one is wrong and the other one is better. Sometimes we, we do what we have to do because the moment calls for it. But ideally, what are we doing to help build the capacity? Mm -hmm. So where is the consent? What is, where is the yes and the no? Right? Yeah. And choice and a voice, right? Mm -hmm. Horses have an opinion. They, they know what they want. They are the subjects of their, their own lives. If we're not focusing on them as being the subjects of their own lives that have nothing to do with us, right? Yes. They, they get to be agents in their own world. If they don't have agency, right? This is, and even humans, if we don't have agency, we shut down. We yep. become submissive. We become disconnected. We become, you know, robotic automatons, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's the same with animals, learn helplessness, right? It's I no longer have agency. No matter what I do, it yep. doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? So yep. offering agency, that's choice and a voice, right? Yep. Empowerment and control. Where where is that in where is that in the horse's experience as well? And again, within reason, because there's gonna be things that sometimes yes. we need to pass that needs totally. to be done. Right. <laughs> no, so we can't go down this trail. We must go this way. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I'm a pragmatist too, right? And so it's, it's not that we're giving, because people will sometimes say, well, if you're giving horses 100% consent, they would not necessarily want to do stuff with us at all sometimes. Mm -hmm. Gr granted, that's true. Granted. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. Some of them don't want anything to do with humans and they're quite happy being in their herds and they're doing their thing. Absolutely. And that's not going to be realistic for all horses. No. Some no. people, the only way a horse earns their keep is by being productive in some way. I wish that wasn't the case. It is, it is a matter of fact. Yes, at right. this time, that is, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think of these trauma-informed principles as where, where best possible, yeah. to the degree that's possible. And it's always possible to add a little bit more. So if okay. one principle is not really possible because of the discipline that you're in or the thing that you're trying to do or accomplish, that's fine. What are some of the other ones that you might play with? Yeah. Right? So yeah. choice, voice, empowerment, collaboration, um, are we in this together? Like, do we both have a say in this? Are we, are you taking the opinions of everybody? So when I think of collaboration and trauma-informed care, usually, usually that means including the voice and the opinion of everyone who might be involved. Yes. So a trauma-informed program delivery would be um, getting input from anybody who's going to be involved in said program before creating the program. Uh -huh. Getting input from potential clients, getting input from somebody who can speak on behalf of the horses, getting input from, you know, parents yeah. and so on and so forth, and then going, okay, what would be a trauma-informed way of approaching this particular issue? How can I build this so that the needs and the voice of everyone are included as best as possible? 
Wow. You know, yeah. Cause normally it's like top down. I'm going to dictate this. You know, I, what I say goes, I'm the, yeah. I'm the coach, I'm the instructor, I'm the barn owner, I'm the therapist yeah. I'm the whatever. Right. I'm the person doing, running the shots. And so yeah. what I say goes, which is not a very trauma informed perspective. No, not particularly. And, and, you know, I, I know from my past can, can lead to more trauma <laughs> generally for both horse and, and students at, at times. So yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. Trust and there, yeah, there's all those other ones too. When I say scope of practice, I'll, I'll kind of um, speak to this. Scope uh -huh. of practice is knowing what you're qualified to do and not do. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Right? So that speaks mostly to people doing equine assisted work, but it does apply to other things as well. So if you're doing equine assisted therapy or learning or whatever you want to call your modality there, um, and trauma is not your area or a particular population base, you don't have particular training in working with that population base, you need to know the limits of your scope and not go beyond that scope. Because when you go beyond scope, that can set up re-traumatization or problems if you're, you're acting outside of your capacity. Yeah. Same thing with your, with your, your horses, right? You've got a horse, you, you've got an issue. You're like, oh my gosh, there's this issue. I see this playing out. I'm going to try to repair it myself by watching a few videos. Yes. You can, you can. I'm not saying not to watch training videos. I watch training videos. They're great. You know, they have their place, but sometimes you have to recognize when something's beyond your capacity. Yes. And is this making it worse or is this actually helping? Mm -hmm. Right. Or is this creating a new set of problems now that you now have to repair? Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's very common as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. We can, we could keep talking for a while here in Sarah. Yeah. I've, I've so appreciated this today. I've learned so much. Um, yeah, we'll definitely have to do a podcast number two here. Um, so before we wrap up today, I would love you to share, how do people get in touch with you? What, what are the ways to see these amazing blog posts and read more about this work and connect right. with you? Great. Absolutely. So for right now, the main website that talks about my horse related, um, forays, uh, I, I suppose you could say, would be equisoma.com. So www.equusoma.com. Um, so equus and soma, but one S. So mm -hmm. um, the horse and the body.com. And uh, there will be a bunch of information on there that will be useful. Um, I have a new website rolling out in the next few months. So um, it should be out, yeah, in the next in the next couple of months. So if you're reading this or listening to this now, yeah. um, in just a little bit, check out sarahschlote.com, S-A-R-A-H-S-C-H-L-O-T-E.com. And that will have a lot more information about my work and my background that's not strictly horse related, but the horse mm. stuff is on there as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just in terms of upcoming trainings and workshops and, mm -hmm. and various other things that I tend to do in my professional world. Yes, and I know you've got some trainings coming up in this, the Equisoma work. Yes, that's right. Um, the, uh, the first round of basics, introductory basics um, trainings will be in 2019. So if you liked this information and are curious about learning more, um, the first one will be in Ottawa in, I believe, sometime in the summer of 2019. Yep. I don't have the dates in front of me, but they are on the Equisoma yeah. website. Uh, and then also south of France in um, the fall of 2019. Great. Uh, two locations. Uh, I used to live in British Columbia. If there's a large population in British Columbia, happy to come back to BC and hang out and bring this there as well. Uh, we'll have a chance to go into a lot more detail about this. Um, the training largely targets uh, people who are trained in somatic experiencing or similar somatic therapies who want to learn about equine assisted therapy from this kind of person perspective mm -hmm. um, and people who are in equine assisted therapy and learning field who want to learn how to do it from more of a somatic and trauma informed and attachment based perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if that's either of your worlds and I would certainly say, check it out. Sure. If I get enough people who are interested, who are just regular horse people who are wanting to learn more about this, then that would fall under my therapist assisted horsemanship app. Um, and I'm happy to bring that out West as well, if there's enough demand for that, which is more about, you know, working with people and their horses from a therapist with a therapist's lens. <laughs> couples, couples assisted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. awesome. Couples therapy for horse and rider. Um, wonderful. Well, I, I, I told Sarah before the call, I was like, I need to come to one of your trainings. So I'm hoping that I can be a part of 
of getting you out west here, Sarah. That would, that would be, be great, Alexa. Absolutely. Excellent to have you. Now, you shared so many amazing resources. I do hope uh, Sarah had said that she might be able to send me a PDF of all the amazing resources she shared today because there was so many. Um, so I will be posting those uh, at wholehorse.ca under Sarah's podcast page. Uh, but is there anything here that you'd like to share? Anything that, that you know you didn't quite get to or that you want to highlight again, Sarah, before we finish up? Uh, trying to think. Um, one other takeaway I will say is this. Um, when you're with your horse, or if you're a trainer or a coach and you're listening to this, it's very difficult to be effective and productive when we're hijacked by survival energy. Mm -hmm. When we're in our anxiety or our fight or flight response or we're dissociated and we're in that trigger state, whether it's because of our own past traumas or it's because we're doing something and how we're reacting to the horse or to the student who's on the horse and we're doing something that's contributing or exacerbating that, that, that difficulty that's happening in that moment. One thing that's really helpful out of the regular human trauma therapy world that applies interspecies is how do we create safe haven, mm. which is an attachment principle and one of the conditions of attachment, especially secure attachment. Mm -hmm. So what in your way of being, whether with your horse or with the students or the, the people that you're working with to train in terms of horsemanship or equestrian work or whatever discipline that you're in, what are you doing to contribute to a sense of safe haven? Mm. is what you're doing and what you're saying and how you're intervening contributing to an activation of the nervous system or a deactivation of the nervous system? Is it contributing to them feeling triggered and in that fight or flight response or in a freeze or in a survival energy, or is it contributing to them feeling safe in the relationship? And when we're safe in relationship, mm. there's so much more that's available because our brain and our body are able to be in the present moment and attend to what's being taught, attend to what's being learned. Right? It's like children in school, children who are terrified by their teacher and they're, they're surrounded by a sense of threat are not going to be able to learn well and produce well in school. Yeah. They're going to check out, dissociate, be anxious, have low grades, and then wonder why they continue screwing up. Right? And then think really poorly of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's no so different with equestrian stuff and horsemanship stuff. And so regardless of where you are, whether you're the coach or the instructor or the human who happens to own a horse or is working with a horse, what are you doing to contribute to a sense of safe haven? Are you regulated in your nervous system? Can you tell when you're activated? What do you do to bring yourself back down into a place of being regulated again? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so important. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that last, that last thought is, is, is a potent one. And, you know, um, sounds quite simple, but <laughs> it can be a journey. <laughs> complex and it's complex. One reason you can intellectualize this and come at it from a brain sort of perspective but this is really something that you have to come to in your felt sense very much so and that's why it takes a little bit more than just an intellectual understanding but that's mm -hmm. a conversation for perhaps another time yeah pausing on that note <laughs> putting that in our next podcast <laughs> um and any other resources you know books Reading. Happy to suggest some readings. I can send that to you, Alexa, Fantastic. and then you can have a, a list on the website of things that I think are really helpful. Yeah, I will be going through those <laughs> and, <laughs> and learning more uh, about this amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much for, for doing this in the world and, and bringing these worlds together um, in this really potent way. Thanks, Alexa. I appreciate yeah. the time today. Oh, well, I appreciate you being here. I can't wait for podcast number two. Okay. <laughs> and I appreciate everyone tuning in. We both, uh, Sarah and I know that time can be of the essence. And so we, we, we really uh, are honored that you spent this hour with us and learning these things. And uh, Sarah and I are both available for questions and, and, and uh, comments. So you can head on over to the the wholehorse.ca podcast page and learn more. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.